even as far away as Canada, as far away as Canada, which is the wonder of Teams and or Zoom. It's open to everyone, however far away you are from Southwell. So very warm welcome to you all. We are going to mute you and ask that you stay muted so that you can hear and remain muted for the duration of the talk. You might also want to turn cameras off because we are recording this talk. Um, so it will be available on YouTube and on our website within a couple of days. You can contact Aoife. Her email is in your confirmation form and she's also going to put it in the chat too when she's finished admitting people. And she'll be able to get the link sent to you or to anybody that you know who would like to see the talk. The talk will last about 45 minutes to an hour and then there'll be time for questions. So we expect to finish at six or soon after. And we'll be inviting questions by using the hand up icon at the top of your screen. I'm just going to show it to you now. There we go. You can put your hand up to speak and then we can see that you have a question or you can use the chat uh, to make comments throughout or to ask your questions. Um, after the talk, Aoife will be sending out an evaluation form and it shouldn't take long to fill out, but we do read every single one. So it'd be very helpful if you could fill those out. Um, the lottery who are our funders uh, like to have feedback and like us to evaluate everything so that would be really helpful. And just a quick project update for those of you who are interested as you probably know work has been going on at the Minster for the last 18 months which has been funded by the Heritage Fund to repair the roof, kind of do conservation work to our beautiful chapter house carvings and also make improvements to the fabric and grounds around lighting and accessibility. And I was in Southwell today and it's actually moved into the garden now. They're redoing some of the paths, improving um, the paths in the palace gardens. And that's the first phase of the garden work. And the reason just for filling you in is just to say that um, all monies donated for these talks are going to go directly towards the um, gardens improvements and we're going to be able to improve the planting and the interpretation which you'll hear a bit more about today and the accessibility so that's great news and we just want to say thank you to all of you for your generous donations today and for those of you who've been coming every week um, over the weeks we've been very touched by your support. OK, so I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Um, we have Helen Eager, who's the interpretation designer for the Leaves of Southwell project. And along with her, we have Canon Nigel Coates, who's very familiar to many of us. Um, he was previously one of our canons here at the Minster and was instrumental in progressing the Leaves project way back in the beginning, several years ago now. And he continues to work closely with Helen and the rest of the team in researching and delivering the new interpretation. So I'm going to mute myself now and pass over to Helen and Nigel. Oh, thank you, Diana. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to uh, the work that may have been progressing with everybody. Um, so today, oh sorry, just getting used to the technical side. <laughs> um, we're going to do a presentation about the interpretation project and it's in two sections. The first will look at the design approach and the sort of design principles that we've um, been working with and then we will do a sort of brief visit a walkthrough to give an idea of what it might be like when um, it opens in the autumn. Nigel, would you like to talk about the um, sort of introduction to the project? Thank you, Helen, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be back in Southall, albeit only virtually. Um, Helen and I, as, as you've heard, are going to talk about the project's interpretation, and I want to introduce this uh, by saying something about the project's context and its development over the last five years. Uh, then I'll hand over to Helen to guide us through uh, the design approach and, and the visitor walkthrough. Um, today we're focusing on the on the methodology of the interpretation uh, rather than the content. That, that, that will be next week. 
so uh, I hope you can join us then too. The two talks very much belong together. Well, those of you with good memories will remember that the project's um, origin lay uh, with a, a leaky choir roof, uh, the Westmoreland slate that was some 200 years old was beyond repair and uh, our architect Nick Rank uh, re recommended that it had to be uh, re replaced and as you might imagine the costs were huge. We approached the Heritage Fund to see if they could help and they told us something that most of us already know, uh, namely that roofs are boring and we should go away and we should think more widely about a larger educational project that uh, would highlight what at least in artistic terms is the Minster's most outstanding feature, namely its leaves in the chapter house. And uh, if by the way we could um, make a case for mending a, a, a leaky roof so much the better. This was a huge but exciting challenge and for a long time uh, because for a long time we'd felt that the leaves deserved to be much more widely known and we also felt that there was not only they were not only of astonishing artistic value uh, they had a particular resonance with our present day uh, illustrating in a profound way the need to recreate re reconnect uh, with the natural world more of that next week so we began anyway uh, a period of consultation and during that time, the government uh, offered some timely help to cathedrals and we were able to take advantage of two uh, substantial grants, I think uh, coming to over a million pounds, that enabled us to repair the roofs of the north and south choir transepts. And this was to be a considerable help uh, when it came to presenting the final bid to the Heritage Fund, because we could legitimately say uh, that we'd started and we now needed money for the main roof uh, alongside uh, the, the educational project that we were going to present. So we assembled a, a project team that considered how we might best uh, conserve the carvings, how they could be preserved for future generations, how we might ensure they were more accessible through improved heating, through lighting for the first time, through wheelchair access, and how the leaves could be reimagined and reinterpreted. And not least, how further grants could be raised uh, to match any heritage uh, fund grant that might be forthcoming. And that period of consultation was, was critical, uh, as were our conversations with the heritage fund during that time. And three things emerged. Firstly, that to develop a project, uh, we had to highlight the cathedral's unique selling point. And uh, forgive the jargon, it's inappropriate language, but it did help us consider what is special, what is unique to the Minster. What is its spirit of place? And the conclusion was that it was the Minster's deep connections with the natural world. The influence of its Ge geographical context, its historical context, Sherwood Forest next door. This was something which offered a profound connection between the inside and the outside. It's Romanesque and Gothic architecture and it's extant and, and the outstanding feature, of course, of, of the chapter house itself. It's no accident that two of the relatively few memorials in the Minster are those two uh, famous naturalists John Wally and, and Francis Willoughby. Then secondly, we were encouraged to develop a project that offered a site coherence. We were to ensure that we linked the Archbishop's Palace, the Garden, Vicar's Court, Potwell Dyke, Higgins Mead, all together and not to be thinking of the Minster alone. This had very considerable consequences. It necessitated thinking about new routes, new material. Uh, it, it meant rethinking how we presented our interpretation uh, with, with regard to a visitor walkthrough and all through the prism of this unique selling point, the, the influence of the natural world. Then thirdly, 
we were to take an approach to interpretation that took awareness of our human resources. And I want to say a little bit more about that later, but inevitably our stewards are key to that. All this led to us offering a visually led approach, something which um, is well illustrated by one of the more experienced guides at York uh, at Minster. She would begin her talk always by asking the people that she was guiding to just look. Her starting point was to help people see and to enable the building to speak for itself. In other words, what we were planning, what we were hoping to develop was to be affective as well as cognitive. It was to draw on the spirit of place. It was to prompt reflection. It was to inspire. It was to evoke wonder. It was to do much more than simply convey information. It was to invite people into a prayerful journey, if you will, recognising that iconic buildings point beyond themselves and they keep the rumour of God alive. And to help with that, we uh, appointed Studio Eager. And I'm going to hand over to Helen now, who's a brilliant graphic designer, and she's brought uh, professionalism, uh, artistic inspiration and very considerable patience uh, to the task of working with us all at, at Southall. So over to you, Helen. Oh, thank you, Nigel. Um, so as part of the project, the um, Leaves of Southwell, we've adopted a new visitor route for the um, cathedral with the following aims to very much place the chapter house early in a visit and at the heart of a tour of the cathedral, to incorporate the whole site and make links between inside and outside, encouraging the visitor to circumnavigate the full exterior of the cathedral and appreciate the views both towards the building and the architecture and back out to nature. Um, and we've had a very sort of fundamental belief in trying to make the project as accessible to everyone as possible. Working closely with the client, we've been doing a lot of testing with visitor groups, which is ongoing looking at the use of things like tactile patterns on surfaces, both raised and inset, use of braille where possible and large print, and use of pattern rather than just colour to help differentiate elements on a map for colourblind. And we'll always maintain some good contrast in text against a clear, clean background. And this has really sort of been at the heart of our design looking at both materials and how we use illustration image. We've also responded to the cathedral itself, creating a colour palette and material palette which is visually light and allows the content to shine. We want to keep a sense of familiarity and warmth of anything that we introduce to the building and use colour which mimics the precision and textures and patina of the carvings within the building with an aim to bring a sense of light and timelessness throughout the interpretation. In a very limited palette of the subtle green and a merry blue with two darker versions to help with contrast. And then sort of core material palette of very natural materials of paper and natural oak and potentially maple as well two woods which are drawn from the leaves that are carved within the chapter house. Our typography, we're keeping the Palatino, which is very familiar to the Minster already and is used throughout the um, branding. And we're adding to that a font called Hypatia, which is also has a geometric and sans serif font, which will be used for most of the body text. It also has the perfectly balanced proportions which reflects the um, strong sense of architecture within the Minster. For the photography that we're using in the guidebooks and also in the um, films that we're introducing to the space, we've got some overarching principles where we really want to, as Nigel pointed out, allow images to lead stories. 
and images that we use the cathedral, we've tried to, wherever possible, to feature people to really emphasise that it's a working church and a place for community. And then we've added to that that images of architecture and nature should celebrate the fall of light and the seasonal changes. We've also um, employed a lot of illustration in the project where we've um, got sort of different palette of illustrations that we're using, some which are drawn directly from the leaves in the chapter house where we're doing simple outlines and also shown here a set where we're using the shadow to show the leaf shape. And then we've also looked at details around the building. Here I've shown an example of the beautiful medieval door at the north porch entrance where we've taken the pattern which is just about visible still and we're going to be using that in some of the sort of end papers for the books and also in the AV and then we've taken other ones as well from things like the guttering and other stone details around the building. Another very important element of the project is the inclusion of art. Um, since the past, the project is centred on encouraging visitors to look closely at nature and the building around them. Um, and in response to how the chapter house itself is a representation of art form of the highest quality, we thought it would be great to work with an artist. And we've um, approached Sarah Simblet to create some botanical drawings of some of the leaves which are represented in the chapter house. Sarah Simblet is a professor of drawing at Oxford University and she's done a beautiful book um, all about English trees which is shown here and she very much draws from life. I love this one of her drawing from a frog right in front of her in a glass. So we sent her out into the countryside and this is an example of um, white bryony which she's done for us. I think this is a really lovely extension of a fantastic portfolio of art that the Minster already has of the chapter house and the cathedral. And we'll also include the um, pencil sketch by J.W. Turner in the short guide. And here I have an example of Sarah's work, which she's just completed. It's very hot off the press of um, a beautiful woodland glade. So with these design principles and ingredients to our sort of interpretation approach, we've then taken these and we've, I'm going to now look at how we've distributed them throughout the cathedral. When the visitor arrives at the north porch, we very much want to make them feel welcome and give them a sense that they're entering a place of workshop, of worship. So we're going to have a very simple board to welcome them, give them a sort of key messages and tell them a little bit about the operational background to the cathedral. And then they will walk through the medieval door. And then they'll be within the sort of nave area where they'll be welcomed by the cathedral steward. Would you like to add a bit of welcome to the stewards? Yes, of course, Helen. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the distinctive and important characteristics of, of a cathedral is, of course, the welcome. If you were to visit a National Trust property, you'll probably join a queue and for understandable reasons, you'll pay an entrance fee. I know in some cathedrals that's also the case, but at Southall, our hope is uh, to continue to ensure free access and the welcome of the stewards uh, is hugely important. Those who know the Minster will know that one of the first things you see in the nave high up in the roof is the Christus Rex by Peter Ball, a figure of the risen Christ with outstretched arms suggesting the inclusivity, uh, the inclusive and, and unconditional welcome of God. And the stewards are there to embody that welcome to all our stewards. And it, it's it's a distinctive if it's a human resource which is so vital it's it's blindingly obvious perhaps but uh, it's um we do need to recognize that we have over a hundred trained stewards 
who are available to greet visitors every day. And in addition, a number of expert guides. And this is a fantastic uh, human resource, uh, which offers not only a welcome, but also uh, because of their training, they're available to share knowledge of the Minster's history and the interpretation of the building. And that has very much shaped our approach to interpretation, as I mentioned earlier. It means our guidebooks do not have to be exhaustively comprehensive in relaying everything we know, because visitors can readily approach and ask about what interests them and make use of our stewards. So this distinctive feature of, of, of the cathedral is something we've drawn upon and built upon uh, in, in designing uh, the approach. Back to Helen. Thank you. So together with the welcome from the stewards, visitors will be able to select a guidebook, which will be on the front desk, and there'll also be a tactile model of the cathedral. And then further down the aisle, there'll be the first AV um, audio film, um, it's actually a silent film, called Worship and Daily Life of the Cathedral. We felt it was very important that the film was silent as we didn't want it to interfere with the acoustic of the cathedral itself. So the tactile model of the cathedral is at the end of the welcome desk shown here and it will be a scale model of the minster itself and it will be sort of like a timeline so you'll be able to see the different parts of the cathedral as they were built. So from the Saxon church will be represented by a line footprint through to the nave, which was added in the 1100s, the choir, and then the chapter house itself. These would be represented by different blocks, just shown here in plan, which visitors will be able to pick up and build the cathedral for themselves. And here I have a little photo of the sample that we've made, which we're testing. So we've asked visitors to sort of test the different textures and make sure that we get them right. And um, we're looking at use of wood and engraving on the wood to represent the cathedral. And then the drawer at the end of the aisle will be the worship and daily life of the cathedral. It will be a silent film of about four minutes visitors will learn about Southern, seeing that it's a hub for both worship and a wide range of community activities and has a long sense of tradition which welcomes all. The film will showcase the Minster's community from the clergy, wardens, choir, volunteers, conservators and the wider community including worshippers, families and friends and the extraordinary setting, craftsmanship and stunning architecture. The tone of the film will be joyful and uplifting and also contemplative. As it's a silent film led by imagery, there will also be animated texts and captions to communicate key messages. And here I've got some sample screen grabs from the film which is currently in progress of being made. Um, and it's just to sort of give you a flavour of showing you that it is a mixture of beautiful close-up of church and then also always bringing it back to nature where we have some drone footages looking around from above and into the gardens as well. <coughs> Excuse me. In the guidebooks we have three key guidebooks which will also be accompanied by a children's guide and here we're showing the short guide to Southminster, the leaves of Southern where medieval stone meets living nature and a welcome leaflet from the Dean. And here I've got a couple of sample pages from the short guide. So here you can see how we're bringing in the pattern from the medieval door. And then we have a use of quotes from literature throughout. Um, and then each section of the, the visitor tour will have a spread or sometimes two to give you sort of highlights of what you might see whilst you're walking around the cathedral. And the back of the book will have a flap with a map to help guide you on the way. So 
so from the nave, um, you will walk up through to the um, north transept, where you could learn about the Pilgrim's Chapel and how the Brownie Apple Festival takes place in the window. And then we're also including a timeline of the amazing carvings throughout Southminster to give context to the chapter house. And then the visitor will reach the chapter house itself, again welcomed by a discreet, elegant board made out of oak. And there will be another draw to the end of the slide, which will be the second AB. And within the slide, there'll be a second touch tactile table and paddles and um, a covered floor mirror in the chapter house and then the Leaves of Subtle guidebook. So the film, The Leaves of Subtle, is a silent film positioned at the end of the slide on a loop, designed that visitors can join it to watch at any point. Again, the tone of the film will be informative but elegant, and it's an opportunity for visitors to see high-res, large-scale imagery of the leaves and details they can't see in situ. So it's really important here that the images sing and really communicate um, the beauty and craftsmanship of the subtle leaves. I've got some sample stills here. It's quite nice this um, AB, it's in portrait format, so it won't feel like you're watching a film so much um, and it'll be quite an intimate experience where you can stand in front of it and um, look at the films and um, imagery with the captions again beneath. And the themes covered would include the craftsmanship and skill of the medieval masons who worked in the stonework, and the symbolism associated with the architecture, the national and international significance of the carvings and the conservation of the leaves. And then also in the slide we have a table shown here with three carvings replicas on it which you'll actually be able to touch. What we're doing is we're taking a single leaf and placing it on top of the capital, which will be an illustration. So that visitors will really be able to feel the exquisite detail of the leaf and how it undulates in the form of it. Working closely with the client team, we've selected three examples, maple, oak and hawthorn. And these again are currently actually in process of being fabricated. And to help us fabricate them, We've taken 3D scans of the space in immense detail, which I've got an example here. And they're quite odd, they look a bit like X-rays. Um, they're taken by a 3D camera, which takes photos from lots of different viewpoints to bring it together to give this amazing detail, which is then um, turned into a 3D print of the leaf which will then be cast in clay. So I'm losing my voice, I'm just going to clear my throat. <coughs> and Nigel, this is a good point for you to pick up about the well covering in the middle of the chapter house. Thank you, Helen. Uh, we, we've for, for obvious reasons, we've tried to resist any uh, intervention in the chapter house uh, other than the lighting and the heating. Um, we don't want to detract from the astonishing carvings, of course. But one exception to that uh, is the re regards the floor mirror. And those familiar with the Minster will remember a large hexagonal table uh, that originally came from Gedling Church and it was used to cover a rather unsightly radiator. And this has been removed, leaving a circular hole about a, me a metre square. And we are uh, proposing a mirror that uh, would be generally covered by a flat wooden lid that would be removable by our stewards and our guides. The mirror enables the splendid vault to be observed and as many of you will know, it's that the vault is unique in being of stone 
uh, supported only by the walls with no central pillar. So uh, uh, th that's uh, to be placed in, in the centre of the chapter house. On the lid, we have a quotation from Psalm 1. Now, you could argue that this is an addition, uh, but we think it's, an entire, it's entirely consonant with our understanding of the historical site for the chapter house. Uh, many of you will know that Philip Dixon, our cathedral archaeologist, has demonstrated that it was the site of uh, an ancient baptismal pool. So the mirror not only reflects the vault, it can evoke the idea of water. And without straying too much into next week's talk on interpretation, I hope you will appreciate that uh, the relevance of the quotation on the carvings. They are like trees by pools of water that produce fruit in due season and leaves which do not wither. So we hope we're not um, introducing a new element to the minster, but rather reflecting on its origins. And that, that will be the one new feature uh, in the interpretive sense of, of the minster. We're delighted incidentally with the new lighting, which is so discreet, you may not even notice it. And uh, the, the heating, of course, is under, under, under the floor. Oh, I can, uh, if Helen's recovered her voice, I can, um, I'll say a little bit more about the guidebook in a moment, but would you like me to continue yes, to say something about that, Helen? Yeah, we'll, we'll do. Yeah, the, the new guidebook on, uh, on the leaves um, will explore several strands of interpretation, of which more next week. It includes a section on the history and architecture of the Chapter House by Philip Dixon and a descriptive section on the botany uh, in which uh, Janet Stocks, one of our stewards, um, helps us identify all the foliage, the creatures and, and the green men. And I'm going to resist the temptation of saying more about um, uh, the second, the last two sections, which are about the interpretation. But Suffice to say, the guidebook will contain much of um, the new research material we've uh, we've worked on, and uh, it's enhanced hugely, as Helen has already indicated, by Sarah Simblet's drawings, uh, which illustrate uh, the final two sections. She's, um, as, as Helen has indicated, a, a, a marvelous artist, and uh, we've chosen her in particular because. Her attention to detail and uh, the naturalism that her, car uh, her drawings exhibit, we believe um, is entirely appropriate uh, because it so, um, it so matches the, uh, the medieval masons uh, accuracy and naturalism in their approach to the, the leaf carving itself. So uh, that's a plug for the, for, the, for the new guidebook, unashamedly. Over to you, Helen. Thank you. So, um, when the visitors in the chapter house, it's, you know, it's so exciting that it's going to be restored to its former glory without the radiator in the middle, um, and visitors will be able to walk around. And we're also offering them um, opportunity of being up, calling a paddle, which would be a simple wooden handheld board also shaped like an octagon so that we can use it a bit as a key to help visitors find different carvings around the space. And there'll be four or five of these paddles and their sample themes include things like finding the leaves so that you could find the best specimens of an oak carving or a maple carving. Who's hiding amongst the leaves? Can you spot the um, chief mason or the person who we think might be the king? Who sat here? Um, as you notice, if I go back aside, each of the chairs has a name on it, and we're going to give some explanation to that. And also look up to appreciate the vaulted ceiling. And I just included this image because this just really captures the whole spirit of our project, where we just really encourage visitors to look for themselves and discover surprises and the history behind the chapter house.
As the visitor leaves the chapter house, they'll move round to the choir, where we really want to celebrate the fact the cathedral is a place for music and also make connections between the flourishing church and the trees opening up to the light, which is seen in the columns opening up to the choir. This is also a space where there's a sense of sort of intimacy and sense of togetherness when the choir is there. And often when visitors are going around, the choir won't be there. So we've developed um, an opportunity for visitors who are on a tour to have a piece of music played within the space, which the stewards would be able to um, switch on, as it were. And um, there would be a beautiful recording played out into the space so that vis all visitors can hear the amazing music. And then from the choir, visitors will walk through to the south transept where there will be more interpretation through the short guide and out through to the palace gardens. They'll also have an opportunity to go via the Archbishop Palace and um, to make some connections and links through from the Archbishop Palace to the garden. We're also looking at um, carving on the stone pathway. For those of you who know this site, there are already carvings on the stone pathway up to the Archbishop's Palace. And we're going to mimic that on this pathway going up to the garden. We'll introduce five of the key leaves which you've just seen in the chapter house and um, give you their Latin name as well, sort of garden terminology, and pick up on our carvings of the outlines of the leaves going directly into the pathway. And these are some early samples that we've been working on. Once in the garden, you'll have the companion guide giving you a bit of information about the different plants and the views, and also connecting out to Higgins Mead and Potwell Dyke. And there's also going to be an outdoor learning centre at the centre of the garden, where it was very important that um, as we're keeping the interpretation in the chapter house itself quite minimal and light touch, we wanted a space where people could gather and learn more and also make those direct connections to the nature around them. So it's here that you could have educational workshops or um, meet with friends um, and it's the start of a few trails that go around the garden. First trail is for the drawings where we're taking Sarah's symbolists some um, drawings and putting them directly in the garden as well and at the outdoor learning centre we'll have a single one on the sort of spinning disc where you can see an example of the drawing and then turn it and learn about the trail. The second trail will be um, of a sequence of carved animals, four or five of them, and we're hoping to have um, a small bird to lead you on your way in the outdoor learning centre. And the third trail is that of rubbings of the different leaves that will go around the whole garden. And here's an example of an acorn, but ours would be tailored towards the leaves that you find in the chapter house. And these are the drawings that will be around the garden by Sarah's other wife, apples, and probably won't cover because ours will be leaves from the chapter house. Um, and they'll be on simple spikes, a bit like you find um, in other heritage gardens. Um, but encouraging the visitor to look, we're just going to include the drawing. And this will be accompanied by a postcard book that you'll be able to buy in the shop, which will have um, each of the drawings again on a simple postcard. And on the back will be some interpretation. And here's, you, you'll be able to tear out a postcard and sh share it with friends and family. And once the visitors enjoyed the garden, they'll be able to walk back around to the front via the Vicar's Court. These are work in progress spreads from the book. That's why they're sort of pink notes, but um, that's how we develop 
the layout, so I thought that was quite interesting for people to see. Um, for example, here we want to retake this photograph because it's not quite good enough quality. Um, and at the Vicar's Court, we'll also include the picture of W.A. Turner, that, um, sorry, J.W. Turner, that I mentioned earlier, of his sketch of the chapter house from the exterior. And then the tour will bring them back to the north porch. And we're just ending on a quote from Billy Ivory. Um, Nigel, maybe you'd like to say something about him because he's writing a preface for the short guide. Thank you, Helen. Yes, um, Billy uh, has been a great um, friend and uh, to the Minster over the years, and uh, he grew up in Southern, of course, um, and uh, he's been kind enough to write the foreword to the, the, the Leaves book. Um, and uh, I think that quotation shows something of his um, of the inspiration he's found in the uh, in the leaves of Southall. Um, and uh, our, our hope is that the project will help others find uh, the same a similar inspiration uh, to what he's found too. So I think Helen, that concludes our uh, our presentation, doesn't it? And uh, we're, we're open to hear it. Uh, to, to, uh, answering any or trying to answer any any questions you might have. Thank you. Shall I stop sharing? Yes, probably Helen. Thank you so much for um, such an interesting explanation of the thinking behind and the rationale behind these wonderful new materials we're going to be seeing around the site to go along with, you know, the the amazing conservation work that's happened. I saw the chapter house recently and it looks very much the same, but it's uh, heating is all concealed now underneath the floor. It's been a real labour of love. The new lighting has just been installed. And if you've been in, near the Minster recently, you'll have seen the grounds are all completely <laughs> dug up and there's the builders hair fencing everywhere at the moment. Um, but it's all positive because the site's going to be more accessible and safer and while retaining its character and its history it'll have those 21st century comforts if you like and these new interpretation materials so it's a very exciting time for the Minster really and it coincides with the Cathedral's wider agenda around uh, becoming more environmentally friendly and uh, around conservation so exciting times so we'd like to invite you now if you'd like to to ask questions of Nigel and Helen you could either uh, use the chat um, which Aoife will be monitoring or you can pop your hand up using the little that you see at the top of your screen there's a little icon with a face and a hand so if you stick your hand up using the um, using that we'll be able to see who's wanting to ask a question um, I'll go to the participants. Uh, well, nobody's got their hand up. Oh, yes, somebody's got their hand up. Beverly, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Thank you for that, that wonderful talk and, and, and the illustrations and that I, I just can't wait to to come over and and, and see um, I'm assuming that the aim in producing the the various um, images and guidebook and so on is to encourage as, as wide uh, a range of people um, as possible to the Minster and maybe people who wouldn't normally come um, could you say something about the choice of images of people and how um, inclusive that will be. I mean, people as visitors, the ones that you depict in the guide. Thank you. Do you want to bat first on that, Helen? Oh, sure, thank you. Um, yes, well, we very much want to reflect the congregation as much as possible. Um, we have actually been slightly challenged by that this year because a lot of the photographs were going to be commissioned across the last six months. So we haven't actually been able to 
deliver on that aspiration as much as we wanted to because obviously the cathedral hasn't been um, as populated as it would normally. Um, Nigel, would you like to add anything to that? Um, I, I, th I think simply to perhaps pick up what I think is Beverly's point that mm -hmm. we, it really is an aspiration to uh, encourage the widest possible or, um, range of visitors, as it were. Um, so yes, there will be pictures of uh, congregations as they gather in the Minster, but also uh, community activities um, which take place in the Minster, which are in, in most most years are numerous, as, as you well know, um, and huge range of children and adults will gather in the Minster for music, for art, for uh, a whole range of activities uh, um, alongside the the worshipping life of the cathedral. So that audiovisual one uh, is intended to pick up the daily life of the Minster, um, which which is intended to illustrate the wide range of people within the wider community who 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 come to the Minster. Does that does that answer answer your your question, Beverly? I don't know if Beverly's still there or not. We can't hear you if you are, Beverly. OK, I, I think that answers the question, Nigel. Thank you very much. Um, Do you hear me now? Oh, sorry, was that you, Beverly? Yes, yes. yes. My, 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 in addition, I would like to ask how you um, might encourage those who don't currently come. Perhaps um, or are, are not currently if, reached. If you don't mind, Beverly, I think there's quite a few questions yes, in the chat. Do you mind if Thank we you. go to the chat and we Thank could you. perhaps pick that up later if there's a chance? Is that OK? Eva, would you like to go to the chat? Yeah, so there's um, a topical question um, that's come into us. So what are the implications of sanitising the surfaces for the tactile exhibitions? Should I start on that? Yes, yeah, do, Helen. Yeah. Yeah, so this was um, very interesting because obviously when we started the project, it's um, hugely, um, well, I was going to say fashionable, that might not be the right choice for it, but, you know, it's very much at the centre of lots of museums' object, um, objectives to make as many exhibits as interactive and tactile as possible. And that's all been very much thrown into question in the last 12 months. It was discussed with the client team and also with our access advisor uh, how we should approach this as, you know, we had really included a lot of exhibits which we wanted people to feel and touch things. Um, and it was decided to carry on as we were, but then put very much into place an operations approach to how to maintain um, cleanliness and comfort in using the different exhibits. So that's, um, I think, will be implemented into the operations programme at the Minster. Thank you, Helen. Uh, did you want to add anything to that, Nigel, or is that...? I don't think so, Diana. We, we do recognise it's a problem uh, you know, it's, it's something that we need to address and uh, just as shops and supermarkets and so on uh, are, do, are doing that, we will need to find our own ways of ensuring uh, the safety of, of, of our... But the best access advice we had was that we should continue with the approach we were proposing. OK. And um, Aoife, do you want to continue with the chat? Yes, um, we've had a question from Tony and he's asked, how will the interpretation connect with the Roman villa? Gosh, yes. Um, that, that's a very interesting one, Tony. Um, uh, and I'm frantically thinking, uh, trying to think how it, how it might. Um, I think one uh, immediate connection that comes to mind uh, is the possibility that uh, the uh, water, as, as you know, at Southwell, that from which Southwell got its name, that there might have been um, Roman uh, nymphs and goddesses 
uh, around, uh, it might have been a site, uh, for, for, they chose it, for, the Romans chose it because of the water and its proximity to the river Trent, and uh, it may have been a place for uh, of, of Roman goddesses right back then. I, th I think the connection will be that places of, th that water, uh, springs of water has always been a, uh, been, has been a powerful metaphor for where we find life and inspiration, uh, where our roots lie. And uh, I think in that general sense, uh, we, we will uh, make reference to the, the early Roman sites that, um, that's what first comes to mind, but I'm sure there's a better answer if, uh, with a little bit more thought. I hope that's a start. Thanks, Nigel. Um, Aoife, back over to you. There's, there's no other hands up at the minute, and I think there's quite a few questions in the chat. Um, there's a question on, um, is the model um, of the Minster blind friendly, which I believe it is. I don't know if you want to expand on that more, Helen. Yes. Um, well, we, we've been working with um, Helen Bates at the Minster to test our um, design approach with visitors who um, are visually impaired. And what we've um, concluded is that we're using textures to allow visitors to feel the model and make it a tactile model so that they can read the difficult different historical periods across the building of the architecture and that this will also be um, labelled with braille as well and then all the um, interpretation will have large print available which I appreciate is not applicable for blind but it is for people who are visually impaired. Um, I think it's just important to say that accessibility really has been at the heart of the project and we've been doing everything we can to make um, accessibility a really big priority, physical accessibility and all sorts of other ways as well. So it's really exciting to have the opportunity to present these new interpretation materials. Um, Aoife, I think you said there's one more in the chat. Yes, it's from uh, one of our past speakers, um, Chris Burke, and he said that this, that so far there's been no mention um, what was made of the exceptionally important 14th century pulpit, um, probably by Master, oh I'm going to butcher his name, but will it feature in the new guide and in the interpretation? I, I can confirm to Chris that it, it will indeed, Aoife, it's in the short guide uh, and, you know, there's much more that could be said about it than said in the guide, but uh, we've got some very good uh, pictures of it and uh, some text uh, to point out its importance. Yes. Oh, it's great to uh, answer a question <laughs> so positively. That's great. Well, um, we don't have anybody else putting questions. Uh, or hands up. So I'm going to go back to Beverly uh, so that she can ask her second question. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, it, it was really picking up on, on the idea of um, inclusive church and, and um, uh, you talked about reflecting the uh, visitors and the congregation at the Minster, but I wonder what um, uh, um, attention has been given to maybe attracting those communities, people, people with disabilities, um, uh, people from different communities in the city of Nottingham, say, um, who perhaps don't currently come to the Minster or engage with it? Beverly, that's such an important question. Um, I hope we've given some indication already uh, what Diana has just said about uh, the, the uh, emphasis we put on ensuring that um, people uh, visually impaired, um, people, deaf people, wheelchair people who use wheelchairs. There's a whole wide range of people that we've we've tried to ensure um, 
are, in, are included in our welcome and, and the minister is made accessible for. Um, but I, I think there's, there is a wider issue, isn't there, about how um, in the broadest terms, the minister can be made a place of welcome to uh, the wider community, and how, how we do that. And, you know, all, all, aren't, uh, all, all suggestions welcome on this one. I, I, don't, I don't want to suggest we've got all the answers here. I, I, I hope that we, we'd have done, uh, the project will do something towards recognising the huge significance of Southall Minster and, and in particular the leaves of Southall. Um, we've, we've written a lot about uh, the connections with the continent, with uh, connections with Rance and with Namburg, and I'll talk a lot more about that next week. But it, it is our view that uh, the leaves have never really, um, outside a rather esoteric, narrow sort of art historian circle, ever received the um, attention they, that, they're, that, that, that they're worth. Um, so we, we hope all that we're producing will highlight uh, their significance and importance. Uh, they've been described um, in the most glowing terms by uh, learned critics and art historians, but we really do want to attract uh, a much wider circle of people to appreciate just what, just how astonishing they are and, and just how they might speak to our present generation. Uh, because we do think there is a very particular resonance with our, our need to reconnect now with the natural world. And we do think we can learn a lot from the medieval masons uh, in, in, in their understanding, in, in their attentiveness uh, to, to the natural world. But I will enlarge on that next week. Mm. And just to, um, also the work that Nigel and Nigel been developing um, as part of the interpretation design goes very much hand in hand with the activity project um, which Diana leads on and that it takes our work and then looks at how to take it out to wide communities and there are things like taking bits of the AV and using that in marketing um, and outreach projects focused around different interpretation points so we may not have covered that in that much detail today, but it's not, it's sort of, we're at the heart of something, a much bigger team involvement on that. If you don't mind me just chipping in there as well around mm -hmm. um, Beverly's question, uh, the activity plan has given us the chance to reach out to schools in the centre of Nottingham and up in the north of the county and to care homes and places that we really would like to um, engage with. And so we have tried to reach out to a broad um, spectrum of the community. Um, and we've involved members of um, different communities in helping us to uh, test the interpretation materials as well. So it's very much been at the heart of what we've been doing. So thanks for that question, Beverly. It's a really um, useful one. Just two more. There's one in the chat which was about foreign language leaflets. Is there a quick answer to that, Helen and Nigel? Will there be foreign language leaflets? Uh, yes, is my quick answer. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to go to Andrew Jenkins um, for one last question. Uh, like thank you very much. And uh, as always, this has been uh, really, really wonderful and inspirational. And we, we are uh, huge fans of, of the, the Minster and the worship and the art and the music and, of course, the Chapter House. And learning about all the measures that you've taken and all the thinking that you've done. We, we also, on this uh, far side of the county, have a, a medieval church, much smaller, of course. Um, and I just wonder whether this, the project could could initiate any kind of uh, sharing of your experience with with others um, who, who would like to achieve some of the things that, that on a smaller scale that, that you're achieving uh, and learn from your experience and whether that could be at some point incorporated into the project so that we could have some of these measures you know put into some of our other uh, churches some of which are very beautiful as indeed ours is thank you
Yeah, what, what, a, what a hugely significant um, point. And I very much hope we could um, be of be of help to. It's been a huge learning curve for us going through this whole process. And um, if there are things we've learned along the way that would help others, we would be delighted to share that. Um, so for the moment, I would simply say, you know, please ask. There are a lot, lot of people at the Minster with very considerable expertise. We've had about 12 different consultants, um, all experts in their field, and we've drawn upon the expertise of the, uh, a lot of people in this. So if we can share any of that with with you, we'd be delighted to do so. Yeah, I'd echo that. As a as a member of staff at the cathedral, we're very happy to share our learning. It's been a very steep learning curve for a lot of us. So yeah, just get in touch. OK, I think um, I'm sorry if you haven't had a chance to ask your questions, but I think it's probably time to draw it to a close. Um, hope it's wet your appetite even more to come and see the final um, product, if you like. As I said earlier, it's a very exciting time for us at the Minster. Uh, our next online talk is on the 4th of May at 2 p.m. And this time we're going to be joined by Canon Nigel again, but flying solo this time. Um, and the talk's going to explore some of the theological ideas behind the design and decoration of the chapter house. Is that correct, Nigel? Yes, indeed. I'll be here to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to that one. It's available to book um, via the website or via Ether if you want to send her an email. And as I said earlier, her email will be in your confirmation form from this talk. So just want to thank Nigel and Helen for a really fascinating talk. I can see the chats lighting up with everybody saying how interesting it's been. Um, it's been recorded, so please let your friends know if they weren't able to make it at a slightly different time today and that's easily shared with them and uh, do I need to thank anybody else apart from the Heritage Fund for providing the funds for the conservation and building work of course so thank you everybody for attending and hope to see you all at next week's talk <laughs>